Hey there, Hoots Owen here. I recently installed some solar panels in my garden because I didn't want to put them up on the roof of my house. It's just too high for me. This video shows how I did it from the very beginning until the very end with them putting out electricity, even in November and December in the north of England. Stay tuned. <laughs> so I'm on the second hole and about halfway down the depth I want to go. So far I've had asphalt to here, then sandstone flags, then some old kind of rubble, then some more asphalt, then bricks. So I've had to smash through each layer with this, uh... hopefully that's clay there now. So now I'm just mixing up a load of concrete, about 14 and 15 bags of sand and gravel and three bags of cement. Robin has just come out to join me. And so what I will do, I've done it three times already, is I work around the edge and just lift it and fold it over so that it tips down. It just mixes it as I walk around. So while you're watching me mix concrete here, I'll tell you about a book called Wind and Solar Electricity by Andy Reynolds, published by lowimpact.org. I read this book before I started on the solar panel project and it told me pretty much everything I needed to know about getting them up there and about wiring and generation and all that kind of stuff. It's worth reading. I'll post a link to a review I did of it here. So what was I doing there? Well, I started off by squaring it off the shed. So I took a number four to the corner of the brick, took a number three over to here and used Pythagoras' theorem to get a five to square that up to there. So that means then once I drew a line from the corner of the garage across the face of that brick, that's square off the, this line is in line with the garage side wall or well, square to the front wall of the garage. Then I set all these pins up fairly, fairly square uh, by taking a distance of 3.2 between the webs, the vertical pieces, and the same here, 3.2, and then from this side, left-hand side for the extreme sides, uh, three meters to there, likewise on the other side, and then I set up the diagonal to check that they were square, so that this is a perfect square to the outside of those gold legs. Then I leveled it using the level. I set the levels with bricks so I could see that as long as the flange on the bottom was at the level of the top of the brick I knew I was kind of okay because they might have sunk or moved when I was measuring again and then came back and checked them again. It takes as long as doing the mixing but this is the bit you want to get right. What I can't explain and what you can't smell is the smell of this timber, this sawdust. It's slightly damp because this wood was left outside, but it's really, really resinous. You can see there's probably 20 or 
what would that be? Yeah, 15 or 20 rings to the inch. This must be some kind of Scandinavian pine of some kind. That's as much as I could say about it. It's what would be called, I imagine, pitch pine. You can see, like, it's not fat, it's resin running through the tree. You just don't, look at the rings there, like they are so closely packed. And that's on the outside, so the, it started off growing quite quickly. Maybe, what, eight rings to an inch. By the time it got out to here, from there to there, you could be talking half a millimeter a year, less. That's unreal. There you go. Beautiful smell. What you can't credit is that this timber has a 3 meter, 3.3 meter length of pitch pine, 11 inches wide and over 3 inches or thereabouts thick. This would have just been thrown in a landfill to be chipped up for something, some kind of mulch or something like that, maybe to be burnt. Keep it going, do something with it. So this is a 12 by 4, 3.3 meters long and this was a 12 by 4 I ripped it in half, a half a cut from each side with my hand circular saw. And then you can see coming down here, and up here, I get to within half an inch of the center because my circular saw isn't big enough. So I'm finishing it with the handsaw. looking good. This one should be easier. I'm gonna pass. Yeah, bang that one in. Big swings. There you go. Big swings. One big swing right out. Swing it right out. I'm not swinging it right Why out. Why not? Because I don't want to. Put it right in there now. Tip it in. Yeah, that's it. I put these screws on the back. This is my favourite hammer that I love, Daddy. We're doing um, we're doing the carpool stuff, aren't we? Yeah.
What's that? Birds? Can you hear them? Oh, wow. Wow. There's loads and loads. A lot of birds. <laughs> it's huge. It's huge. <laughs> Are they geese? They must they be. They might geese. be. They're very high up. Wow, there's loads of them. Yeah. Gotta be maybe 100, 200 there. Wow, okay. Back to screwing these things in. So I've got the basic square structure up, but to give it some rigidity and putting in these the little diagonals for bracing, I've done a half lap, well a half lap on the diagonal. I've done that one and I've done that one over there. So how I do it, I cut them to length, 45 degrees, but because I'm using reclaimed timber, there's a big gap there, it's all twisted. So I have to mark out where to take out the lap one like that, one like that. I've settled on a lap depth of the width of this washer from here to here. So I just put it like that. And drag it along. I saw this somewhere on the internet. Uh, this is a two-handed operation, but if I do it over here, It's a really useful marking gauge because I don't want to mark off the edge of the wood because I know the wood's all crooked. I want to mark off this wood so you can see the gap in there. If I do this trick, it gives me a line that's the right distance off here and so that line there will be the same distance as the line I put underneath except that it'll be from this surface rather than from the edge of the timber, which is warped. It's taken me a few weeks to get to this stage because I've only been doing odd days on it. But it's a timber frame with steel legs. You can see the foundations there. They go down a couple of foot into the ground. They're surrounded in concrete. And then there's timber legs that go up and are braced and whatnot. And then it's got this peculiar Y arrangement because I wanted to get it up a bit above the ridge line. Although in reality, I could have put it down a bit, but then it would shade my grass and I've got very limited space but I'm going to get a 9 by 9 solar panel arrangement up on top of there all the timber was free or reclaimed so the white wood I've sawn that up from bigger pieces I got these 12 by 4s and I've sawn them up into these what are they 6 by 2s and then into 6 by 4s for the legs and then the other timber is all reclaimed from roofs of houses locally so it's pretty good in terms of recycling i think managed to look out on some good quality timber because the price of timber has gone up crazy recently a while ago i bought 14 solar panels and a solar inverter i've previously tested some of them to check the inverter was working i think five in a row five in a string 
I've got these four washed and cleaned now. One, two, three, four. And I'm testing them as I go. I've got 10 more to wash and clean before I erect them on my solar carport frame. As you can see, it's not a particularly sunny day. There's a big ball of fire somewhere up there, but it's obviously not as wide as that. It's completely obscured by cloud and then there's some thicker clouds coming in between. So you can see they're not in full sun. There's a bit of shade on the bottom, so we won't get a full reading out of it. So we can only test a couple of things. We can test voltage and current. On the back of the panels, you'll see peak power. You'll see open circuit voltage, which we can check now. And we can also check short circuit current. Open circuit voltage should be up around 39 and short circuit current should be 9.45. That's in full sun, I reckon. The voltage should be the same regardless of the sun. So I've got it set up to do current now, but I'll change that over to this plug so that it's got the fuse in place and I'll do voltage. Uh, one of these is positive and one is negative. So this is a positive plug. Put the red lead in there and this is the negative. Put the black lead in there. We're getting 36.7. What did I say? 39? 30, we're getting 37 there. You've got to remember that the whole thing is not in the sun. The sun isn't full. So I'm not too worried about that. That would drop off at night time and there would be no voltage. If I plug this out here and put it over to the high current test, this 10A slot. Turn this all the way around to 10A. If I put it on any of the other ones, or if I, was to test, if I was to test the current on any of these, it would just blow the fuse in the device. And you just put a new fuse in, but I don't want to pay for fuses, obviously. So we've got negative. And there is no sun at the moment. So this is an overcast condition. And we're getting 0 0.84, 0 0.8, 0 0.83, 0 0.81 of an amp, which is pretty low. 0 0.9, 0 0.93. As the sun comes out and as the sun moves around, you get more. I think if I was to obscure it somehow, my hand isn't big enough because I'm fighting the sun's coming out as I put my hand over it. So that's the sun coming out and you can see the current rising, which is kind of cool. But it's way below, I think nine was the maximum, was it? But of course this is in November, so that's what you're up against. Up to the top, yeah. Thank you. So let's test this one now that it's clean. The same thing, we'll test for current first because that's what the multimeter is set up to do. Plus and plus and plus, minus and minus. I'm expecting maybe a half, 0.23, like it's dark now, there is no sun. So this is just ambient. The sun is behind a really big cloud, but there is something coming out of it and it seems consistent with everything else this morning.
I'm at the eve of the solar panels and I've got three more rafters to cut off. Temporarily I held them on with these blocks and I wondered what they do it, but they're obviously like nowhere. They're not very elegant and I think in time that one's already bending, they wouldn't last. I need something that'll keep the rain off this. I also want to get a gutter up underneath to catch drips. So this is a solution I've come up with. To hold the panel down and to stop it sliding, I've put a piece of aluminium angle with a little hole and a piece with a wider piece with two more holes. So in total, there'll be five or six holes or screws holding the bottom on. And then I've got this face here cut so that I can get a bracket on for guttering. And what I've been doing is putting in a little piece of that bituminous tape, like this stuff, as a flashing to protect the timber. So it'll come down from underneath or from, from up here, it'll come over the aluminium and then down into the gutter. It's quite simple really, but it took me a while to come to the conclusion really the think the thing to do is to use horizontal rails and I had the possibility of doing that but I thought vertical would be better because by putting screws this way it would stop it sliding but that's kind of nonsense I don't think it really matters they're not they're not in the slightest bit heavy what you're really worried about is pulling up and down from wind wind loading and snow sliding's not the biggest issue and snow is not really an issue where I am and so that's the flashing in there wrapped up around two screws or three screws and then this bracket will go on here. There should be enough to get a purchase on there. It should work like that. So I screw in these three screws and then I drill a pilot hole here because I've got a self-tapping screw like this, but it needs something, needs a hole to go into. But you're drilling through this aluminium, which is quite thin, a mill or two. And on the other side is this glass with the wafers, solar wafers right behind it, like you could feel them with your finger. There's just a layer of plastic. You don't want to damage them, you know? So I've put in a piece of timber, a little block of timber slides in. And when I'm drilling then with the drill, I'll quit now before I go through. But when I'm drilling anyways, because I'm holding this with my hand, it'll go to the timber before it goes to the plastic. Some beautiful videos on the internet of fuse boards, consumer units that are really tidy. Really, really pretty, careful things, you know. The neutral's isolated from here. Should be. Still using the screwdrivers that won't zonk, zonk me. Put in like that. Push that into the back a bit, just to tidy it up somewhat. Turn that one on. Turn that one on, no smoke. Number five, solar. Right, let's go out and check the unit then outside. So up as far as here, I've got it all wired. And up as far as here, I've got it all wired. That's off, that's off. Here's the two solar cables, they're off at the moment. Let's check them out. I'll put that up there so you can see it turn on to 600. I've checked this already, but we're up on 300 odd volts. That's, it's off at the moment. That's coming in from the solar panel now, 314 volts. And I've got it set up so that it should clip together. So that's the positive. And it should clip in here. I'm really nervous, so I'll switch it off again. <laughs> I'm really nervous about doing it because I'm going to cock it up. I think it's right though. So that's positive. Click. I'm going in on the line one side. There's two sides to this inverter. Check out, I made a video about this inverter previously when I was testing it with just a few panels. Click. Um, on, yikes, on, green light, flashing, initializing, oh, that's what we like, grid 234, 235, so that's the grid and the frequency of the grid, just under 50 hertz, so that's coming in through my grey cable on the right, there's a relay clicking on, Zero seconds, relays, outward, zero watts, 81 watts, 89, 88, and that's coming from nine panels on an overcast day. Is that even running the lights in the garage? 
<laughs> I don't know. Let's go outside and have a look at it. So it's the middle of November and this is what the weather's like. And there's the panels and you know, it's it's a bright day, but there ain't no sun. And if there was a sun, where would it be? It looks like there's light over there, but that's only because that's where there's the fewest clouds. The sun, this time in the morning, the sun should be up that way. So they're in the shade anyway. So it's ambient and it's putting out 92 watts. And that's what it's doing. <laughs> the plan in time is to take Andy's advice and to put a little cooling fan blowing air just up through these fins. It's got quite good aluminium cooling fins up here. You see it in there? Uh, so they should keep the system cool, keep the inverter cool, but equally a little fan would only help. Granted it needs to go up to 98 watts. Granted the fan itself needs to be um, <laughs> under what you're generating. 100 watts, 101. 99, we're back again. <laughs> Let's get the cover for this. This is put in because I've put nine panels up. I've got five left to put on a wall. So this is for later. I've just screwed it in because I had the hammer drill out and then I can bring a cable in of DC from the wall of, the, from the second string and uh, put it in there and plug that into this uh, it later as it stands. We're up to 108 watts. So I've just put it in because I have it and gets it out of the way. Statistics. So I need to put a sticker on this and say what it was beginning at, because this machine has already run lifetime. So it's been on for 25,000 hours and it's made a total of 187 kilowatt hours. So I need to write down 18745. Mid-November, it's sunny, but you can see on the camera, it's not gonna blind you. Solar panels are all in the sun at this point in time in on the inverter and in on the inverter we're getting 1.3 kilowatts it's dropping off a bit there so let's just go in and see if I've managed to save any of this electricity or if it's all going into the grid so right now looking at my main electricity meter to the grid it's got it's got the red light on which means it's exporting and looking at my auxiliary meter which demonstrates or which counts how much electricity I've exported to the grid. That light should, yeah, it's flashing, which means I'm pumping out electricity to the grid. Despite the fact that all the residual load is on in the house, there's a couple of fans on, and the washing machine is on. So even with the washing machine on, it's still escaping, which is terrible. I'm back out again, it's dropping off a bit. There must be a cloud, but it was at 1.1. Now it's dropping back to eight something. It'll do that all the time, but it's still generating it. And as long as it's generating and I'm using something, then I'm not paying for my laundry, I'm not paying for the residual in the house, and that's excellent. What a success. The noise in the background is my compressor working in the garage, but it's up to 1.6, almost 1.7 kilowatts. The sun's come out a little bit more. It's very difficult to demonstrate, but the angle of that sun to the solar panels it's not right, like the solar panels would need to be up something like this at 70 or 60, 60 degrees, 70 degrees, but they're actually set at 25, so they're not even getting the full effect of the sun. And there's cloud in the way, you can see it. And even with that, 1.6, almost 1.7 kilowatts. It's amazing, 